And all we really want to do is figure out how to take a syllogism and figure out if it's valid or not. Something I want to highlight here at the beginning is in this introduction class, we're only dealing with things that are unconditionally valid. Uh, there are lots of times when um, things could be valid only under certain conditions. And we're not going to get into that, but I just want you to know that uh, if you hear about conditional validity, that would just be something for a more advanced logic class. So that's the first thing I want to highlight. Okay, so let's recap uh, categorical statements. If you remember, let me get my pen out. Uh, each one has four parts. And if you recall, this is our quantifier. This is our subject class. This is our copula. This is our predicate class. We're going to introduce a new term in a little bit, and we will end up renaming the subject class and the predicate class. And you'll see why we need to do that in, in just a little bit. But here's our basic parts. We diagram them on a Venn diagram. And you can see, I'll zoom out so you can see these things as a whole, um, right? But we have our S and our P, and then we have different regions of this, of this diagram that describe what's going on in that region. And so I'll zoom in a little bit just on the diagram itself. And so we have region one, and region one tells us, right, when we see something here, um, we're talking about members of the S class and that's it, only the S's. Um, and so then we have region three, right? And that deals kind of with the opposite, things that are only a part of P, but not a member of S at all. And then we have a place called, well, we're naming it two, uh, where it's the member of both classes. So if you're thinking about maybe a basketball, right? A basketball is both a thing that is orange and a thing that is round. Right, so if we put roundness as our subject, round things, and then over here we have orange things, right? If that's our P and that's our S, well then here would be a basketball. So if you're having, if you had questions about just what goes on with a categorical statement or these diagrams, that's a quick overview. And then if you remember when we go to diagram them, themselves we use shading right shading means nothing exists there and that's really important to wrap your mind around we say all or no we're not saying anything exists or not we're just saying if it did exist this is what it would be like uh, and that can be difficult to wrap our minds around but it's also pretty important and and x is our other type of mark and that means at least one thing exists now, this is stuff you should be aware of from prior units, but if not, this is just kind of the catch up. Now, we're going to go over the moods really quickly. And if you remember, we had four moods. We'll zoom out and look at hopefully all of them at once. All right, so we had A, E, I, and O. And just for shorthand, we, won't, we don't have to get into this too much, but uh, here's how you diagram each statement. Uh, you'll want to have these things memorized so that you can do the syllogism diagrams quickly or really any of these diagrams quickly uh, so let's just walk through them one by one quickly we have our first one all srp that's our mood a statement and to represent that uh, we just shade in region one right because we're wanting to say that there's no s's that exists that are not also P's, right? So there's nothing here. We'll just use kind of, right? There's nothing there. How do we represent that? We represent that with this shading. Uh, and so moving on to the next one, mood E, right? We have no SRP, right? So we flip it. And so how do we represent that? We're gonna use shading to show that there's nothing in a particular region. And then we're just going to shade in uh, the overlap between S and P. Then we move on to I. All we want to do is say that at least one thing exists, so that's going to be an X. And where's that X is going to go? Well, this X is a member of both S and P, 
And so it's going to go right here in the middle. Finally, we have our last class of statement, and that's O. And we want to say that there exists an S somewhere that is outside of all the P's. Right, so we just put it out here and we use an X. All right, with that refresher, let's turn to syllogisms. We can just use any combination of the moods and any number one through four to represent all possible categorical syllogisms. Uh, so with that long digression out of the way, let's look at it. diagrams. Okay, so this is the diagram. And uh, notice that we have just a combination of VINs, uh, and I'll highlight that for you. But first, let's look at and highlight that uh, we have our subject class, our predicate class, um, and then we have that middle term. And so that's the new circle that we've added. Uh, you can see that we now have a bunch of different regions, right? Everything that's S, stuff that's both S and M, stuff that's just M, uh, stuff here in region six is stuff that's just M and P, three is stuff that's just P, right? You can see how this continues to go on. Uh, four is S and P, seven is all three classes, and then eight is just something outside of all of that. So with those things said, how, what VINs show up? So the first premise in all of our syllogisms will deal with the M and P circles. And so you'll put markings in uh, anywhere between two, three, four, five, or six. Premise two, all right, as you can see, we're dealing with S's and M's, our minor term, and our middle term, and you can see the regions there. And then finally, always, always, always in our conclusions, uh, we only have the subject and the predicate, the minor and the major terms. Uh, and so we're only dealing really with this bottom area. Now, something that we need to keep in mind is that we never diagram the conclusion. And we'll talk about why in a little bit. We never diagram the conclusion, uh, but that is where we would look for it when we go to test for validity. Um, so, okay, let's walk through how we do this. Uh, so in general, what we'll do, and this is a completed diagram that I have here. Okay, so let's talk about the diagramming rules. So if we have a universal premise and a particular premise. So, so if we have something like all P, R, M, uh, and then, right, so that's a universal. And then we have something like sum M, R, S, right, that's a particular. So when we have those two types of premises, the key thing, and this is key, is to diagram the universal claim first. We want to rule out where nothing exists. So then we can then talk about, okay, well, what's left over? Well, it would have to go here. And you'll see why this is important. Exactly because of number two. There'll be times, and we'll see an example of this. Uh, so there'll be a time whenever we know that something must go in one of these two regions, but we don't know where. Uh, what we do in those cases is we draw an X on the boundary of the two regions. When we don't know uh, which of two regions where something should go, we place the X on the border of the two regions. So that's the key thing in two. Uh, and then finally, we just have our uh, criteria, right? So if something is valid, it must be, it is the conclusion uh, represented in the diagramming of the premises. So those are just the three rules. Now let's talk about the method. And the method will look a lot like the rules, but just a little bit more explicit. First, we want to diagram all of the universal premises, right? So those are just A's or E's. And it doesn't matter in what order you do them. You can do the second premise first. You can do the first premise first. It doesn't matter. And then you move on to the particular premises, right? So the I's or O's. And you can do them in any order. The main thing is just to do the universal premises first. Uh, and then we have that if when there's uncertainty in two regions, you use uh, the border of the two regions. Uh, diagram the conclusions in a separate Venn diagram. Uh, and then you want to compare the two, 
And if the Venn conclusion is represented in the Venn of the premises, it's valid. So let's walk through one example. Okay, so we have that A, I, O. And so you can see how this is an A statement, right? That all P, R, M, the I, right? Some R, M, and then our conclusion, our figure two has um, premises, then the middle term, then the subject, and the middle term, and then the subject and the predicate, right? So that tells us where the terms go and we can see that same pattern in the syllogism. So hopefully you can kind of see how that's written out. Uh, so, okay, you want to say, is there a universal premise, right? Absolutely, universal premise. We have that A and then our particular statement. We, we do have one of those and it's our second one. Okay, so we need to diagram that universal premise first. And we have all P, R, M, which means that there's no P's that lie outside of them. And so we just shade in those regions. So that'll be region three and four. Now it's time to do our particular premise, premise two. And here, if we're just diagramming it by itself, we would know that just a regular sum S or M, and that's just gonna look like that because we're just saying something exists where these things overlap. But then when we get down to our diagram that includes P, well, we don't know exactly where the X is going to go. And so where do we place it? Well, ordinarily, uh, we would place it in the middle of the two regions, right? We don't know. So how do we represent that? We say, well, it's either on one or the other, but we don't know which, so let's put it on the border. Uh, so then that is how we diagram our second premise. And that's precisely because the diagram does not give us enough information uh, to know the relationship between this and this, between uh, the overlap of the middle and the minor term and then the major term. We just don't know. So we represent that uncertainty by placing it on the border. Uh, okay, one second, check something. I don't know what I just did there. I lost my meeting controls. So let's just walk through this and then I'll, I'll try to look at that. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see where we at. So we've diagrammed the, the premises and we wanna know what would the conclusion look like? So we need to turn towards the conclusion. And this is what the conclusion should look like, right? Some S are not P. So we would just want, right, as we see this right here. Uh, so does this show up in the VIN of the premises? Well, let's, let's take a look, let's compare them. So here's the diagram of our conclusion by itself. Here's our diagram of the premises. And you can see um, this X here, if it were to show up, it would either be here in one of these kind of areas. And we don't know, let's take that one out. Uh, so it's either in read, it would either kind of exist in region one or region five, but we don't know which. And our X here from, from our second premise, again, we don't know if it's, if it goes in region five or region seven. So this is something that could be valid, but we don't know for sure that it is. And remember that's, that's our criteria. The conclusion must automatically or necessarily follow from the premises. It doesn't, so we cannot say this is valid. So hopefully in this quick, quick discussion, so you can see how to set up arguments. We did that quickly, but we did do that. Uh, we know what each of the eight regions represent. We can mark up a Venn diagram for a categorical syllogism and then we can compare diagrams to test for validity. But I do wanna say it is overwhelming all at once, but like a lot of stuff in this phase of the class, if we lay out our kind of instructions and go through them one step at a time, each individual step is straightforward, even though when taken as a whole all at once, it can seem pretty complicated.